least we can slowly get started. You welcome to the unfortunately last storyteller session uh, for a teal around the world now. So it's near, it's coming closer to an end, but we have another one now with uh, Juliane, who is joining us here today on the on the topic of psychological safety. And as I already mentioned, the, the session will be recorded. So turn your video off if you don't want to be on the recording. Otherwise, very happy to see you all here in this session. And the setting will be that we have around 20, 25 minutes of storytelling from Juliana. She give, gives uh, yeah, many insights for us. And then we have a Q&A. And I will put the Menti link uh, in the chat. So that's the best way to go if you have questions. So we make sure we, we, ca we catch all the questions. And you can also vote them up there. So then I will see later which are the ones that you are mostly interested in this group. And I think for now, everything is said that we need, and I can hand over to Juliane. Thank you very much, Britta. It's a pleasure to be here the third time now. So I, I, I'm one of the lucky people um, who had the opportunity to speak at every Teal around the world, and it's always a great event. So hopefully next year again. <laughs> Uh, today, I want to talk about metrics um, because I think that's a very important um, topic, but also a difficult one. So maybe I can give you some insights to my thoughts and I'm very interested in what you are thinking about it. And I would be glad if we could have some discussion afterwards. Um, you can also find me on LinkedIn. For example, so if you want to get in contact with me, find me on LinkedIn, for example. So my name is Juliane. I'm head of Agile Transformation at HDI Global. HDI Global is the industrial insurer of HDI of the Talanx Corporation. And I'm an industrial engineer um, in the field of electrical engineering. So nothing to do with people in the first place. But as I told Britta yesterday, um, Immediately in my first job, I recognized that you can build amazing processes, that you can use the best technology, but if you forget the people, you can forget your project. Um, I've got 10 years of experience in leadership positions at different companies and industries. So this is my first insurance company. Um, before that, I was in the manufacturing and um, automotive industry and in the beginning, I was able to join an um, energy company, so very different companies, but as I, I can tell you, same everywhere. And um, I've got also some startups at the moment too. Um, it's changing over time, but at the moment too. Um, I'm glad that I'm that I also had the, the opportunity to be an author and a speaker, um, obviously. And in my free time, I'm a sailor and a Lego builder so I like to build create models from with Lego bricks. As I said um, I would be glad if we could have a nice discussion afterwards or um, later on um, so get in contact with me and then we can see. So why are we talking about metrics um, nowadays the agile transformations are on. <laughs> Um, if you are not as lucky as Britta to work for a company which started already in an agile setup, but has now to change. Um, when, when you are working in a company that has to change now, like me, um, it usually means to change hierarchy to net into network organization. So something like this is familiar to everyone who works for a traditional company. And now we are changing from this hierarchy to something that we call network um, organization, meaning that um, there's not no longer someone who can uh, make every decision. Um, it depends on the people, everyone has to take over responsibility. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone. And that's the first message I want to transfer. Um, it's everyone's turn to take over responsibility. Everyone needs to show ownership and become a leader. And why is it possible? It is possible because when you think about this hierarchy organization, and now you imagine to take this cone and put it 
um, on the top and then you pull it towards you. What's happening is something like this. So you pull the top of the cone to you. And finally, you end up in a network organization because every hierarchy organization is also a network organization. It depends on your view on it. And um, I would like, like everyone to change this view because probably when you are working in a, such an organization like I do, it's not possible to change um, the structure of the organization tomorrow. That will need some time. But what everyone can do is change the, the own uh, view on the organization and um, how to act in it. Um, so obviously we need the network organization and also metrics um, to survive in the VUCA world. Um, but the problem is, or what uh, happened in the past is that metrics have been seen as a controlling system. And um, unfortunately, I think this is a misuse of metrics because in the first place, metrics are information and we need information to create transparency. And those information do not have any valuation. So we have no good or bad metrics um, in the first place. Unfortunately, many people think that a metric is good or bad, uh, depending on what you expect. But I think that's um, an opportunity to learn because you are creating transparency with your metrics and then you can enable inspection and adaptation. Uh, what we all know are the three pillars of empiricism, which we need to survive in the VUCA world. So um, metrics, as I said, serve to provide necessary and valuable data. And what for? Um, for when we have a look at teams and organization, the data is necessary and metrics are necessary to constantly learn and develop because if we do not have any transparency, if we do not have any metrics and data, we will not know if any of our measures that we take undertake will be successful because we, we cannot see um, how something develop. We can just um, rely on our gut feeling and usually that's not enough. So that's why I think it's necessary to, to think about metrics and to take on this topic. Um, and when you think about the topics of metrics, um, from your point of view, maybe you can put it into the chat. What's important from your uh, point of view when you think about metrics? What are like the main aspects that should be considered whenever you start an initiative based on metrics? You know where we stand? Please connect, yes. Useful, yes. Reliable data, everyone should understand what's measured. Yes, um, I think there are a lot of um, interesting aspects or important aspects already in the chat. Thank you very much for participating. Um, I think that um, we have to think about all this and um, Mm, I, I just uh, saw something like everyone should understand what is measured and um, they should be useful and the right things should be measured. And it's important to know that always the context influences the type of metrics. So we cannot take over metrics on a corporate level for every team because every team is in a different situation depending on the product, depending um, on how long the team already exists, um, depending on the mar market situation and so on. So they are very, very much, very um, different things that can influence metrics. And that's why we always have to consider the context um, because without considering the context, we were not, we will never be able to, to have a good interpretation and evaluation of the data. Um, 
so that's why we need a differentiated point of view, obviously, on metrics. And this is something that I miss um, most of the times um, when I when I look at companies. Um, I see huge uh, KPI systems uh, all over the company um, uh, with no differentiated everything is for everyone like um, like this KPI system and that won't help. So the differentiated point of view starts with the level of information that I, I need. So when we are thinking about the market level, I call it the large scale weather patterns. So everything that is around the company would be the market level and you definitely need KPIs, how the market develops and what's going on in the market so that you can um, adapt to the market. And there are also company level, uh, how the company performs as a corporation, corporation in a whole. Um, and then we have the team level. So what does the group achieve and the personal level? And I think um, every initiative that we start um, in the company should be done by people who can really influence um, whatever needs to be done. And therefore I would recommend, or we always start at the team level. And that's I want to, that's the thing I want to focus on in the next few minutes. Um, so when we have a look at the at the team level, um, from from just from experience, I derived three main areas um, of metrics that I would recommend to use within a team. Uh, first one is happiness, because if you are not happy, you won't be productive at all. There's another way around. So if you are very productive, then it, you will be more happy than you have been before. Um, but without any um, least level of happiness, you won't be productive at all. Second one is effectiveness, because you can be very happy and do a very productive job. But if you do, don't do the right thing, it won't last long. It won't be helpful for the company. So that's why I think effectiveness should be the second one. And the last one is constant pace, because what we see is often see, unfortunately, is that we are doing the right things, but we're doing it way too much. So that the people cannot keep this for a long time. Um, you, you probably know also constant pace from the, the agile principles. And I think this is a very important one just to be sustainable for the people and uh, to, to keep in mind that we that we should do that for years, uh, many years, and that we should be able to do it for many years. So that's the last one. And um, so when when I look at teams and when I work with teams, I try to find their metrics together with them with regards to those areas. And um, just to give you an impression of what I mean, I, I have here I have three very easy, very down to earth metrics that I use um, with regards to teams um, and, and the three categories. First one, happiness, as I said, and the easiest way for me is to see in the end of a meeting, for example, just check with the people, how was the um, return on time invested? So was it a good idea to join the meeting or wasn't it? And um, then you can get an impression of how um, how your your meeting went and what you might address in the next meeting. Um, probably many of you know this already, and uh, for me it's very easy and it takes two minutes to do it every meeting. And it shows how happy the people are um, with what you are doing. Constant pace. Um, there I, I took the burn down chart because probably this is nothing that I have to explain and it's uh, just uh, to save some time. <laughs> um, so constant pace, you can see um, how everything goes in your burn down charts. And um, if um, yeah, the team can consequently work on whatever is their job. And the last one is effectiveness. Um, this uh, is more around the corner, I think, um, 
or you have to have more, you have to think about the corner. Um, we, in, in an ideal world, of course, the backlog would be full of everything that's in a story map that is customer related, that is uh, with regards to their demands and so on. But in reality, it's often it's not. Uh, many teams uh, get bombed by whatever is also necessary in the company and um, then the product and the customer really gets to the background, is getting pushed to the background. And uh, we want to make this visible, at least we want to make it visible, um, for example, by this what we call backlog storyline, a uh, story map alignment, um, where you just check if your backlog items do have any relation to the story map so or to customer demands whatever however you uh, you visualize your customer demands for example you can do it with a story map and i think it's very important um, in especially in companies that um, are on their way through the transformation on the journey to to become agile um, it's necessary to keep in mind that the customer is the most important person in our team and that we have to um, to work on whatever is necessary for him. So here you can see these are really three down to earth down to earth examples. Um, very easy. You can do it on a piece of paper. It's not necessary to have any system. It's not necessary to have any um, any Excel sheet. It's not necessary to have any complicated whatever formula. It's just down to earth and for me this is very important so that everyone can start in their teams from day one. Um, management has also a role in this as you can imagine because um, they are also very interested in transparency and in what the teams are doing because they are always afraid that the teams are doing nothing and uh, so it's important for them to see uh, what they are doing uh, but they should rather um, create framework conditions and they should support teams uh, when they are thinking about metrics and um, metrics from my point of view should be only for the team and they should uh, they should also be, be developed by the team um, because then um, it's necessary then they are able to find what is necessary for them what helps really helps them in their daily work and they should never be misused as control instruments. And clearly they are, or they at least have been misused in the past. And, um, but we have to overcome this or we need to overcome this and um, to, to get some turnaround in, into the work with metrics. Managers should rather come up with their own metrics because they of course can influence a lot in a company and that's why I recommend that they uh, take care for themselves and not for whatever the teams are doing um, or what, uh, whatever they are measuring. They should measure their own contribution um, and help the teams uh, to develop. And here are some, oh no, they are, they are coming in a minute. <laughs> um, here is why um, we need the management to create the best framework conditions so that the teams really can focus on, as I said, what the customer needs, on the customer demand on the products. And um, what we want to create is personal flow. So the optimal experience, um, a sense of one skills are adequate to cope with means that um, people need the feeling that they have the right skills to address the challenges um, that they are confronted with. And, um, Maybe you also know this feeling, which is characterized, which characteristics are that the concentration concentration is very intense. Um, you forget time and and space, and um, yeah, self consciousness disappears. So this is when you really deep dig deep in something, and that you when you are very concentrated, and two hours later you think like. Oh, I haven't eaten for a while. I should eat something, or I should drink something. Um, when you really forgot. It, um, eat, eating and drinking, um, this is the best condition um, and, and the best um, way of working that we can be in. And of course, teams can also have this flow, kind of flow. Um, so this is a shared experience of flow. 
um, when people are working together in a team and, and share the same interest. Um, so management should uh, not look at the team metrics in the first place. Um, if the teams want to share, welcome. But um, in, in the first place, management should develop their own ones. And uh, when you look at, at these three categories, um, one is information uh, sharing, uh, two is decision making, and third one is organization design. Here you can see many aspects like uh, how many interfaces are, uh, do you have in your value chain? Um, how many hours does it take for, for an information from A to B? And um, how many people are involved in decision make, making? How many people can say to the product owner, for example, no, your decision is wrong. You should do it differently. Um, and also with regards to the organization itself, um, how many people are on a, on a, on a project, um, how long and uh, how many units are involved and so on. So here you can see many examples for management metrics that could really help the teams to remove impediments and uh, to have a smooth uh, flow within a company. It uh, would be great if it would be easy, but it's not, unfortunately, because um, transparency and um, coming with that metrics do have to do a lot with psychological safety. Uh, this is really a prerequisite for successful usage of metrics, because otherwise it can happen that metrics will be abused or misused for um, whatever aims. Uh, so. When you, when you think about retros, that should be the most trust-filled um, room um, or space. And um, so uh, psychological self safety is necessary for giving and receiving feedback for open communication and to create transparency on whatever you are doing. This is only possible when we think about metrics as information with no valuation in the first place and um, because then you can can come up with metrics um, and um, you, then you can look at situations where you have a gut feeling that is not working well and using metrics you can prove this or even unprove it um, but the result might be not satisfying so um, then you, it's necessary to see it as learning opportunity and this won't happen if there's no psychological safety so um, respect trust and security are the key words um, in this regard teams need this to come up with their ideas um, also with mistakes or whatever went wrong um, also with their concerns and um, then they are able to learn from each other and one characteristic of, of psychological safety is that there are no negative consequences for speaking up. And of course, um, they need to be aware of their own responsibility. That's what I said in the beginning, everyone needs to take over responsibility and also for knowledge sharing and contribution to the goal of a team and the entire company. Um, managers need to support this, as I said, and they can also really destroy um, this atmosphere. So what can be helpful? First, um, they should treat failure as learning opportunities. Second, they should trust the people and let them decide, for example. Uh, third one is they need to create transparency on what's going on around the team so that um, their, their teams know what happens in the company and of course transparency on what they are doing and what they are achieving. Um, they should co foster common positive experiences um, for the teams but also for the entire company and of course they should only make promises that they are able to keep. 
trust is something that is uh, that has more um, more faces probably than than we think in the first place. Um, but trust is, as I said, something that is also a prerequisite for coming together as a team, for uh, being a high-performing team, and of course, takes a while to create it. And um, I just want to uh, to show you the three aspects that I see in trust. First one is, um, of course, trust from others and. Uh, we think that trust from others is something pretty easy because every one of you and myself, we know ourselves and we know that everyone can trust us, so it's no problem. Um, but of course, um, it's not as easy um, as we think, but usually we expect trust from others when we get to know people for the first time. And... Um, and we, we sometimes need to take a step back and think and consider that maybe we have to build this um, trust from others. Because when I think about, when you think about from trust in others, um, how often do you think, of, think by yourself like, something like, oh, I do it on my own because then it will work. And um, so this, this pretty simple example shows that trust in others is not that easy. Um, so this might get, give some hints when you think about the trust from others, because it's just the other way around. And the third component of trust, and I think this is uh, often missing or too often missing, this is the, the self-confidence, so trust in yourself. Because everything is changing at the moment and um, you need to trust yourself that even if you come up with a metric, if you create transparency and the situation is not as you think it should be, no problem. You will keep your job and you will get the opportunity to change it and to, to get to this. But um, unfortunately we have, or we had some bad examples in the past and um, so self-confidence often is pretty destroyed by those bad examples. Nevertheless, um, we need to build it up. And um, I just wanted to mention these three aspects of trust because I think um, it's, it's not as one dimensional as we often see uh, the trust component. And I think it's important. So as a little conclusion, I think that agile transformation requires the turning, the turn from hierarchy to network and everyone needs to take over responsibility in this. And metrics can be a very powerful tool to learn and develop um, for the people and the organizations, but unfortunately have been misused in the past. And um, yeah, we need to repair this Metrics are really important to achieve transparency, as I said, and then we can inspect and adapt, which is our basic process um, in agile context. Um, and don't forget, it's always a matter of perspective and um, of the context, wherever you are. Everyone has to start with oneself. That's why I prefer very simple metrics. So think about metrics for yourself, for your surrounding, for your direct surrounding that you can influence. And it's very important to start immediately because um, I know many companies that forget this or that try to ignore it um, in the teams. Psychological safety is a prerequisite for dealing with metrics and still building trust needs time. And what um, I often recognize is that management asks something like, why are, we, uh, why are we so slow going through the agile transformation? And um, this is confronted with insecurity um, and with our, yeah, the situation that we do not know what's going on and what's happening. So this is uh, pretty dangerous coming together and we should invest 
in building trust so that we can start with metrics. Thank you very much. This was a short insight. Thank you for attending the session. And now I'm looking at the chat and looking forward to your questions. And as nice. I said, looking forward to exchange. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Juliana, for the insights that you gave. And I really love the picture of the pyramid, which you just kind of flip around in all directions and get a little ball into your network. So I really, really uh, like these pictures. Um, so if you have questions, I post again the Menti uh, link in here, and we already got some questions in here, so we can right jump into this. So the first question that I see here is, so how do we encourage colleagues to report on what hasn't gone well? So as well as what worked well. So actually both directions and for sure this needs uh, psychological safety to, to get, this, uh, get, get this out in the teams. What is your, what are your suggestion? Anything? Sorry? What was the question? How do we encourage it? Colleagues to report on what hasn't gone well. So also the failure to share this. Yeah, yeah this is, has to do a lot with psychological safety. And I think that we can only experience um, it over time that whenever we come up with some some failure um, that it won't do, have any negative consequences for us and um, what I really recommend is um, the teams or people in teams is always uh, when they are afraid of of coming up with failures um, or mistakes or whatever how we call it um, that I, rec I always recommend it to, to start with easy, easy things like something like um, this morning uh, when I opened the fridge, um, the butter fell down on the floor. Because everyone can relate to this. Everyone has uh, experienced this and, and everyone else is there. <laughs> and, um, and then they will see that it's, it's not a problem to share something like this. And um, so I tried um, to help them find some easy things to share um, from, their, uh, from their own life and from their projects uh, so that they can easily start or start with some simple examples and then um, increase uh, the degree of mistakes, for example. Yeah, this, this also maybe, um, so there's another question, which also in regards to trust, which are the practices in daily life that you are using to encourage and keep this trust? I could imagine the, the one exercise that you just told, like start with little things and then people, yeah. okay, I tell the story and nobody, like nothing happens, nothing bad happens and then I might <laughs> keep going, yes. And yeah. so do you have any more practical um, things that you couldn't put in place? Yeah, I think um, there are two aspects that help to create trust. One is um, that you have specific agreements on how you want to work, so that you can that you have something explicit that you can really rely on. And um, the other one is getting to know each other, so getting to know each other also in a personal way. And I think a wonderful toolbox for all this is the management 3.0 toolbox because uh, you have something for getting to know each, each other like personal maps uh, where you just have a kind of mind map um, uh, for yourself and in the middle is your name and then you can write down values and um, how, where are you from and what about um, education and what about your work and so on. And uh, then people get to know each other and they can build links um, because when you then write down, for example, uh, so I, as I always do when I'm talking about hobbies, I always write down Lego and usually I find someone else in the group who likes Lego <laughs> and then you can start a conversation about it and get to know each other and this always helps to create trust. And also in the toolbox you have something like the delegation poker that probably most of you know. Um, this is a re really nice and hands-on tool to create explicit, explicit agreements uh, where you can rely on and um, um, where you can where you have some transparency about agreements. I think this this also has another um, tool is, is something like a team canvas um, where you also make purpose and goals your own and the team's goals explicit um, where you can talk about strengths and weaknesses of the team. So I think it's helpful to make things explicit 
for the entire team and um, getting to know each other. And so what is what is if um, there are already barriers like on the personal level, which you then also start with like tiny things that are not so so personal and then move forward to a bit more personal stuff. Yeah. yeah. When when I work with personal maps, I I see differences, for example, in what people want to share with others about themselves, but there's always um, at least the education and the, the work component. And usually it's the most easiest things to share. It's, it's way harder to share something like values because you have to think about it before you share. <laughs> and very, and very many true. people think about it. Yeah. yeah, very true. Okay, we have another question in the Menti um, about the measurements. So should we measure effective, effectiveness for teams working in an agile way? So kind of does this make sense because agility is about like feedback and communication and fast failure is it not somehow contradictory to measure yeah i have these measures in an agile in, in an agile sphere what do you think about this i think that effectiveness is the core of agile i think we are we have we always have to talk about or we have to always ask ourselves the questions, are we still doing the right thing? Are we still doing the right thing for the customer to make the customer happy? Um, are we still on track? And um, and this is exactly um, what we try to find out with, um, with consequently looking at um, transparency, inspection, adaptation. So we, we have a look at changing environments and we need to adapt to those changing environments because if we just continue with what we did before and now the framework conditions are changed completely we won't be effective anymore so we we um, consequently have to think about are we still doing the right things and if not adapt to the new situation and then we are, i would say uh, this i would call agile and how would you make sure in this scenario that it's not does it not that it does not feel co like control that like people get controlled about the measures that that are that are in place? Um, when I start start with metrics, when I start working with teams, I try to keep them safe in a safe place, so I, I won't share them with, for example, management. Um, we, for me, it's necessary to create positive experiences with with metrics, so that um, that teams develop their own metrics and when whenever they have their own metrics then create positive um, experiences in this regard that they understand that those metrics will help them in their daily life and that it makes their life easier and um, that after that management will be probably more satisfied with what with what the team comes up so so, um, so this can help to um, to keep yeah to have the have them secretly for the team only and uh, not share, share them with management in the beginning and at the same time working with management um, to to um, to create their metrics and then ask the management if they would like to share their metrics first um, because then um, uh, that's a step uh, towards the teams if they start sharing the metrics and very true so it's kind of a flip so the 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 metric just serves myself or my team and not serve the person not the management or whoever is uh, on the outside to to control yeah. thanks for sharing um we have one question so maybe i'm in a team or like an outsider go into a team or i'm in my own team so how do i see if that there is no psychological safety do you have any symptoms that you can observe in the work that you are doing what you always see when you have the feeling okay there is no safety in in this team for example yeah and uh, maybe you know five this functions of a team the concept by uh, linksioni um um very recommended read if you haven't so far and um one of this what he called dysfunction is uh, too much harmony in a, in a team so when you have team where you do not have any disagreements this is a clear um hint that there's no psychological safety because nobody comes up with any ideas with any disagreement with any 
suggestion to do it differently um, with any criticism um, for whatever happens. Um, so this is clearly uh, one of the uh, one of the hints that um, helps to see this. Very contradictory, right? <laughs> And what be, would be the first three steps that you would do? Like if you really see, okay, there is no psychological safety in this team. And if you say, okay, I want to give uh, to the audience now here some hands on. So what are the first three things that you would, would implement or would start with? Mm, um, so when I start working with the team, I, I would um, probably uh, uh, plan an offsite and uh, take them out of their daily business, try to um, really get them into their space uh, so that they can get to know each other um, if it's possible. Um, if not, I would uh, really try to use um, retrospectives to create um, these connections between the people but because that, this is uh, crucial, I, th I think. And um, therefore, I would probably tell them a lot of these things that I told you today. So um, I would uh, definitely start with the why, um, because it's necessary for the teams also to understand um, why it's important to get together as a team, to grow as a team, um, because this is also a change depending on, um, on the people that you work with. Um, they might, uh, might have grown up in a, in a situation where it was uh, usually like I have my work life and I have my personal life and those two do not have anything in common. And um, so for a lot of people, it's a, it's a huge change um, now to come up with their personal, um, what they are doing in their personal life. So like hobbies, um, but also to come up with emotions and so on. So, um, I would I would also try to explain why it's important. Um, I think this is this is necessary. So yeah. Thanks. Um, let's shift a bit over to the topic of responsibility. We have a few questions here in the in the menti. Um, and one question is how do you make people to take over responsibility? I mean, what can you do from the outside? Actually, in the end, I mean, in the end, it's the person who has to take over the responsibility. But how could you could you support or could we support from the outside? Mm -hmm. um, uh, probably two answers to the question. Um, usually, people get up in the morning and they want to to create something. They want to do something. They want to be uh, part of something. They want to. Um, yeah, they, they don't get up in the morning to destroy something, to be bad to everyone um, and to annoy everyone. Um, so usually uh, people get up to take over responsibility. This is what you can see um, when, when you look at um, like the tennis club or the kindergarten parents, uh, representatives and so on. Um, so there are many uh, hints usually that people are able to take um, over responsibility and they want to do it. So the question is why don't they do it if they don't do it? And the, the answer is can be that a person um, um, has any is, is ill in a, in a way, um, but you won't fix that. So this is something uh, you cannot you cannot fix. Um, there are, people who should do this instead of you. Um, but the most people who, who do not take over responsibility at the workplace are people that do not have the right surrounding. So for me, then the leadership is the leadership team. And I mean, of course, the disciplinary leadership, but also uh, people like Scrum Masters can uh, then find out what would be the best surrounding for the person. So maybe there's a person just in the right um, place, but has not the right uh, framework conditions for work, or is the person even in the wrong place? So, um, and, and then you should think about and work with the person, of course, um, how to improve. Um, but I think that we, that we are sometimes too 
quick saying like, ah, uh, this person um, won't never take over responsibility. So, and um, a second aspect in this regard is that some people are able to take over a huge responsibility, like we can see at the moment, people, we, uh, there are people that can take over responsibility for the entire nation. Um, but there are also people that are not able to do this, um, but they are still able to take over responsibility for a smaller piece of it. And um, therefore, I think it's necessary to find the right amount of responsibility for everyone. And this can be different from person to person, depending on the personality and the characteristics of a person. Thanks for sharing. And we have uh, one question. This is um, going so somehow a bit a differentiation between responsibility and accountability. So the question is, could it be that people who don't want to take over responsibility are confused with the accountability on it? For example, a good leader hands over the responsibility to a team, but the leader is also still accountable after this. Or how would you see the difference between these two, two words? Mm -hmm. um, I think I, I know the situations um, because I, as you know, I, I work in and, and I did before work in traditional companies moving towards agility. Um, so we still see situations like this that um, the disciplinary leadership um, has is accountable but tries to hand over responsibility to the people. Um, but uh, the goal should be that the teams are accountability, uh, sorry, accountable for um, whatever they deliver. Um, so I, from, from my point of view, we should also shift um, accountability. And uh, it's an interesting point because I think um, this is forgotten sometimes. So you see, see it both in the same place, like so the person who is responsible is also accountable for, for the things that they are doing. In the end, yes, <laughs> at the moment. And maybe, no. <laughs> maybe then it's also easier to take over the responsibility, right? Yeah. Could be. Um, we have a very specific question here as well. What do you think about individual goals for sales teams, uh, considering the need of building the sense of community and collaboration in team organizations? But when you then have these individual goals or maybe have kind of competitions also between teams, how do you see this in the in the teal context? Mm, I believe that um, individual goals can be fine, but um, often they conflict with individual goals from others. And this should be avoided, definitely avoided. Um, so um, I think that we need clear goals as humans. Um, this is something that you can, can see when you look at um, computer games, for example. So when you think of World of Warcraft, uh, World of Warcraft, um, millions of people play it million hours daily. Um, and uh, I often ask myself, why do they want to play World of Warcraft and not uh, the HDI game or whatever company you are working in? Working in? And um, there are some main characteristics of computer games. Um, and one is that they have a clear feedback system. Um, so when you're doing something, you get immediate feedback. Uh, second one is that there are clear roles and they are consistent over time. So they do not change. And uh, the last one, and that's why I'm telling you the um, this story, computer games do have clear goals. So um, you always know um, where to go. So a computer game would be boring without goal and uh, people won't play it. So I believe in goals. It's necessary to have goals. And um, the question is just how to, um, how to build the, the goal system. And as I said, um, I think the most or the key aspect then is to consider um, if you have individual goals, do they have any, or are they in conflict with any other goals um, that someone else has in the company? And if yes, bad goal. If no, okay goal, I would say. Then it's depending on the context. I hope that helps a bit. 
Thanks a lot. And maybe this goes a bit in line in this one. Uh, there, somebody's asking for like a concrete or concrete uh, examples for metrics uh, that would be meaningful for a team that also could include the type of organization or culture. Do we have any kind of also different or interesting metrics that you have seen that are not the usual ones, which, which we normally see what the, the teams maybe came up with, which maybe also surprised you? Hmm. I think um, the most valuable ones are the easiest or the easy one or the simple ones, the easy simple ones. Um, I have to think about any surprising um, metric. Um, I think there's no no uh, general recommendation for any metrics. I mean, if you if you see that um, your meetings are boring, no one says anything, everyone uh, runs to the coffee kitchen afterwards and is telling the people, the other colleagues, how bad the meeting was, then you should think how of metrics um, with regards to your um, to meet, to your meeting, which can be the return on time invested, as I explained earlier. Um, if you if you can perceive a bad atmosphere in your teams, like everyone sitting together, no one is talking, um, faces uh, show that no one is interested in the others and in what the team is doing, and so on. Find metrics that um, that create transparency on what's going on in the teams. Why are the people not satisfied and um, for example um, something like happiness door maybe you know this concept that you just have your office door and um, you have a scale on on the on the side of your office door in on the top it's uh, best day ever today and uh, on the bottom it's like worst day ever and um, then people can put sticky notes to um, to the door frame explaining what's happening and then you can address whatever is um, posted on the sticky notes um, of course you can all do all this also in a remote context no problem Miro mural concept board uh, your choice of boards uh, you can put a door there as well um, and and take the metrics and uh, so maybe it's also something like um, what I um, mentioned earlier, when when the team has um, has to deliver a product, for example, and um, every day someone uh, gets addresses the team saying, "Hey, you need also to do this and that," and mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, then it might be a helpful metric to measure um, what do, did you plan um, in your planning, for example, planning event. And how many uh, tasks have been um, um, have been taken over additionally from your team because someone management whoever wanted it, and um, then you can make this transparent also to the to the management saying, hey, look, um, we we you asked us to deliver the product, uh, but on the other hand, you give us. Um, 50% new tasks every um, every sprint so that we cannot deliver the product um, as fast as you want. Um, so the metrics then helps you to find some uh, to, to find some uh, basis for discussion. Um, so really depending on the context and what you want to achieve, think about the simplest simple, the most simple way to um, to to measure it. Right. And what about like the employee or like if I would be an employee and I would say, okay, I want to create a bit more psychological safety for myself and also for, for my surroundings. So what could be a few individual steps that I could directly take? Uh, uh, talk with people, talk with your team colleagues, um, start uh, telling them something about you so that they can connect to you. And um, I think that everyone uh, can influence the situation and um, coming up with uh, personal details 
like hobbies or what did I do yesterday or what uh, what's my what my uh, what do I have planned for the weekend for example so um, yeah I think that we can that everyone can um, influence the situation in a positive way by starting by yourself. And would you also then recommend, like, for example, if you go into a company and, as I said, sometimes it's good when it comes from the management so that they are the first to, to start with these conversations to build the trust in the whole team? You mean the management should start with the trust? For now, for example, like to open up. So if we go back to a more broader broader level, um, as you said, okay, the measure, the management might be the first people who who share the measures that they have decided yeah. for. Maybe these are like kind of role modeling. If you yeah, if you want. Yeah, definitely. And of course, whenever you have any town hall meetings or other public um, events, um, the management should behave like wow, there have been some brave colleagues that created transparency on X, Y, Z, and that really helped us to, to learn this and that. And we then were able to develop ourselves and now we are delivering a more valuable product to the customer or whatever is uh, whatever the result is, um, whatever the outcome is. And, um, and I think those uh, stories then help Uh, to see that measure uh, that management um, has a different view on it. I know that's the most difficult part in it. And um, as agile coaches, we should uh, start with management immediately. Right. Start working with management immediately. Thanks. So we are running out of time, Neely. So one one last question before we wrap up. Um, the, how do we overcome barriers to building trust in teams where there has been issues with? psychological safety before so maybe there is a bit really bad experiences that happened there any any thoughts on this yeah i think that many um uh, many teams are not brave enough to ask for help i think that it's it's fine to ask for help to to find some external uh, person who helps in this process just to guide the team uh, through the process and um Of course, then it depends um, whether there might be a, a historical conflict between two persons, for example, that influences the entire team. Uh, then you might try to solve this um, this conflict first. Um, this depends on the team, but um, usually, I think that it's um, it's a really good idea to find a, an external person, not necessarily external. External can be just team external um, to have to guide you as a team through the process because um, everyone in the team and if, if there's also someone like a team lead or just the product owner or scrum master or whoever um, usually they are um, they are very involved in in the situation and um, then it's very difficult to to step outside and guide the process the, the team through the process so it might then be the best way to find someone outside. Thanks a lot, Juliana. So yeah, time is running and uh, we have to come to an end here. Thanks a lot first, Juliana, for your time and inspiration, your talk and all the answers to the questions that we have. I know there are some uh, open questions, but we will continue the conversation also in spatial chat. I'm not sure, Juliana, if you have time to join, but if you have time, you can also jump over after this session in the spatial shed in garden four. And yeah, before we close the session here, if you have anything last to, to give us uh, on the way, Juliana, I hand over last time to you as well. Yeah, just uh, saying thank you uh, to everyone who joined the session and was uh, again a pleasure. Thank you also, uh, Britta, on behalf of the entire organization team. It was, um, it was a great event, uh, unfortunately coming to an end already. And um, I think it was very well organized and uh, the community is great. So uh, thank you very much. I'm very glad um, that I can be part of it. And um, yeah, if, if there are any questions afterwards, you can also send me the list of questions. Um, I can answer them uh, also, can write the text down. Um, but as I said, you can also contact me on LinkedIn or wherever, and then we can continue this, the discussion as well. Thank you very much. 
Thanks a lot. And see you then now in the spatial trade. Everyone who wants to join, just jump over. Make sure to close down Zoom before you jump and we see each other there. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.